thank theologies for the clergy. I just believe in Jesus. Certain hermeneutics of eschatology demand an exegetical approach. I think you shouldn't question what you were taught in church. Isn't that blasphemy or something? Theology. Theology. Unplugged. Hey friends, welcome to Theology Unplugged. I am Michael Patton. We've got a great discussion today. It really is very good discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to do all that business you're supposed to do whenever you're here and I'm supposed to be advertising stuff. Oh, there are some things that I do, do want to talk about. We do on Credo courses have coming up a um, our, our Black Friday special. And it's really, I mean, it's the best time to get all of the courses on on a uh, thumb drive. It's just on one thumb drive. It's great. It's just uh, uh, 217 gigabytes. Yeah, gigabytes. That's why I said gigabytes, over, over 2,000 downloads. I mean, it's just incredible. And it's all the best stuff in the world. It really is. And it is cheap. It'll be under $100. So check that out. And also, uh, you know, get some, get some fun stuff like this hat. Uh, this hat you can get at my store. You can get a lot of t-shirts and sweatshirts and even blankets that are credo courses theology theology themed blankets how's that i mean shows the entire christian worldview it's great if you've ever seen my arc my arc illustration of god in the universe that is that is on a blanket i promise you go check it out so is martin luther so is john calvin tons and tons of stuff to get at our store at credo courses so go there check it out one other thing real quick, don't forget to support us if you enjoy this, if you like what we're doing, if you believe in what we're doing, support us at Patreon. That's the place to go. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. You've probably heard rumors. There's whispers. Yes, well, these whispers are true in the sense that there's lots of stuff going on, and we're we're working on getting an, the actual Credo house back, and we have a lot of... Lot of uh, opportunities. We have a lot of things in the background. Just just hang tight. I'm going to keep up with you guys. Uh, uh, everywhere that I, I keep up will be Facebook and Twitter and, and the email list. So if you're on any of those, then you will see it sometime soon. But for right now, just don't forget to uh, support us there. Um, get free tons of free stuff if you become a patron. I mean, $25 a month and you get it all digitally, everything free. So go there, check it out. You can get $3 a month. I write a whole lot. Uh, I write extra, even more than I write on my blog. I put it on Patreon, so that's a great place to go. Anyway, here's what I want to talk about. Uh, you you see the title. The title is uh, something, uh, you know, I... I I, I, I usually don't jump on people and say they're wrong and use their names. Now, you got to understand, I've talked about Wayne Grudem so many times in a positive way. I love Wayne Grudem. I have a rule with my kids. It's called the 90-10 rule or the 9 to 1 rule. You have to compliment somebody nine times before you ever have the, the right, the, the credit the uh the, the clout <laughs> in the situation to criticize them once and i have criti- i i have uh spoken about Wayne Grudem way more than 9 times in a positive way but he does serve as a good illustration of how i think he did go, people do go wrong whenever it comes to systematic theology so that is my subject systematic theology but most specifically the definition of systematic theology. How do we define systematic theology? Now, I'm going to get my, my, look how old my Grudem book is. I mean, I got this in 1990, I don't know when, uh, ni- the 1990s, like 1995, right, right after it first came out. And I love Grudem, I really do. There's not a better systematic theology out there that is uh, lots of stuff I have problems with. But he's an incredibly smart guy, and the way he arranges this, the way he teaches, there's just nothing better. It's there's not. I mean, it's it's the best systematic theology out there. Still is. Okay. Yet at the same time, it is a systematic theology, and he defines systematic theology wrong. <laughs> so how could it be that great if he starts so wrong? But let me tell you what, how he defines it. Here's here's his definition of systematic theology. Remember, not just theology systematic theology. His definition is this. 
What is systematic theology? Many different definitions have been given, but for those for the purposes of this book and following the definition, the following definition will be used. Systematic theology is any study that answers the questions, the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? So it answers the question. What does the Bible teach us today about any given topic? Now, that might sound good. That might sound, I mean, for you, you're like, what, what's the matter with it? I mean, he's, he's elevating the Bible and it is, you know, talking about topically. And uh, isn't that what we do? We open up the Bible and we go to the various, er, uh, the various doctrines, Christology, uh, theology proper, angelology, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, all of those things, we that's how we divide it. And so whenever you're trying to find out what, what is true about uh, eschatology, the end times, don't we go to the Bible? Well, of course we go to the Bible. Of course, the Bible is our not only a source, it's the primary source, but that's the thing. It is a source. Uh, that is That is my argument in this, is that it is more than just it is more than just uh, the Bible that we go to. And I know that might sound heretical to some of you guys, but it's true. You can't help it. I mean, even if you claim that you only go to the Bible, you don't. You don't. You have all these pre-learned, you, you've pre-learned so many things before you even got to the Bible in order to understand the Bible. So this is something that that you have to understand and categorize and see what is the proper place to put all of our sources. So I've been writing a lot on this. Uh, you probably know that I've been writing a lot on a lot of stuff lately at my blog, credohouse.org, not credocourses.com, but credohouse.org. You can go there and see see my blog. There's, there's lots and lots of blogs, and we have great discussion there. But I've done two that are relevant to what I'm talking about to today. Uh, the most evident is one a few days ago called the top five sources of theology. I did have, I did want it to be a top 10 list, but there's not really 10 sources that are so different from each other that we could put it there. And then another one, top five sources of theology. And then another one called the theological ecosystem in a nutshell. I know those are the, neither one of these seem too sexy, especially my blog today. By the way, I did write a blog today, uh, reserved power, the forgotten virtue of meekness. Go there and check that out just for me. Okay. Just for me, go there and read it. I know it doesn't sound great. And I know that you don't come to me for a sermon necessarily, or maybe some of you do. But I love to talk about this stuff. I mean, it it is a theology. I mean, talking about the theology of meekness. So that's very important. But go there and check that one out. But let's get back to our topic. What are the five? Let's let's go through first and talk about the five sources of theology. And then I want to talk about the theological ecosystem. The five sources of theology. I'm going to pull this out and let me put it over here so that I can see it better. Oh, where? Oh, no, no, no. I need to move this now over here. Sorry about this. Okay. I can see your comments. So that's good. Uh, just in case you want to comment, just in case you want to ask something, I can see them. I'm pretty sure. So let's talk about the five sources of theology, the, uh, top five sources of theology countdown. Um, and, and here's what you want to do. You want to think of systematic theology I mean, gosh, systematic, systematic, what does that mean? It means, number one, that you categorize it, it's organized, and it's and it's broken into its places. But really, it's just talking about that it's a whole, it's the complete, it's, it's systematic, it's, it's everything, all how everything works together. So if we're talking about systematic theology, we're talking about a systematic understanding of everything in some ways. So it's a big puzzle. Our life is a big puzzle. Our understanding, our beliefs are a big puzzle. And we've got all these pieces to the puzzle, right? And we want to use these pieces rightly. And so whenever we're talking about our puzzle, think of it in such a way to where whenever you use the Bible, that's just one piece. Yes, it's a big piece. And yes, it's a big enough piece for you to be able to see a lot of stuff clearly. But don't you want to use the other pieces that God's given us? What if he gave us more than just the Bible for us to research? You may say, Michael, you're sounding like a Catholic. 
because that's what they do. They look at tradition. Well, I'm telling you, part of what they do is true and right, and even the reformers would agree. I'll try to make that argument in a minute. Hopefully, I can be I can do it. But the but there are sources. There are more authorities. I'm going to go that far to say that there are more authorities in our lives and in our theology than just the Bible. I'm not trying to be edgy. I'm not trying to downplay the Bible. I'm just trying to help you to understand how you build a true systematic theology. So you've got a puzzle. God, and think of it this way. God has given us five sources. Some of these are more central, like the Bible, and some of them are more on the outer edge. But we are building with those sources. And I think it's better to say it this way. This may confuse it. But instead of five pieces of a puzzle, you've got five sections of a puzzle And each one of those have many pieces. So we're building on every section. So we don't have a perfect understanding of anything, including the Bible. So whenever we're talking about the five sources of systematic theology, how it is that we learn about God, how it is that we can be confident in our understanding, our puzzle, what is the fifth source? Well, the fifth source, I'm going to start with five, and then I'm going to go down. Uh, to the number one source. You probably know what the number one source is going to be, and and you're right, but just hang with me. Listen to these other ones, because they're important. They They were given to you by God. Now, the fifth one is called mystical theology. Now, I really like mystical theology. I like it more the older I get. Whenever I was younger, it was like, I'm too cool for mystical theology. I'm too cool for things about the emotions and our personal experiences. All this subjective stuff, leave that out to anybody else because I just want to deal with the truth and objective stuff. Well, it's you're, I'm, I, I mean, it is true. We want to be as objective as we can, but at the same time, we are built to experience things. We are built for personal experience. And if God gives, gives us a piece of the puzzle um, that that is part of our experience, that is part of our emotions, then why not use it? Uh, I like the mystical theologians. Actually, whenever you look back in history and look at the mystical theologians, my favorite is Pseudo-Dionysius, the Areopagite. I know that's crazy, but he, he's just He's just a fascinating author. It wasn't really Dionysius, I guess. I mean, I've never studied how we know that that wasn't him. It's probably because it was written so late. Dionysius was in Acts, and uh, uh, he was with Paul. But um, uh, you've got mystical theology, and here's the basic things about mystical theology. You've got personal experience. Mystical theology involves direct, personal, and communal with other people, encounters with God, often through things like prayer, meditation, contemplation, and spiritual experiences. And so uh, here, uh, I kind of make fun of mystical theology sometimes as if it is something that is unimportant, or at least I used to. But the thing is, in the end, that, that piece of the puzzle is the one you use the most often. I know you say you don't, you say you don't, but I'm telling you, you do. doesn't matter who you are. That is what you're using. It's the most powerful in the sense of having its, its uh, innate ability to affect you. And the whole idea is here, whenever you have an experience, I mean, nobody can, you, you can't really argue against it. Whenever you're, you have a personal experience, then you can't argue against it. I'm not saying everybody's personal experience is true, but I'm just saying whenever somebody has a personal experience and they really believe it's true, that is the most powerful thing that it's very hard to overcome. And most of the time we have to just look at the experiences and interpret them correctly. That's how it is with all these pieces of the puzzle. We've got them all, but are we interpret? Are we putting it upside down or sideways? That kind of stuff. So it's personal experience, but it's also emotions. This gives way to the emotions. Ultimately, the very end game for us in our life is to say, hey, we want to be emotionally stable. If you've ever been un- emotionally unstable, like I have many times, it hurts. You'll do anything to get out of it. It is the the it is it will be the only thing on your mind. It's something that's unlivable. It's very it's it's very definitely hard to have uh, emotional instability. 
And so whenever you are, you know, thinking through how it is that in your thinking, you can provide comfort to yourself about God and about the future or whatever else, you usually will do pretty much anything to get your emotions stabilized because we can't function without our emotions. We are emotional beings to deny that is, and I put it on here, um, it says, all who undermine its importance and relevance will inevitably fall by its sword. And that is true. So we've got all kinds of things. I mean, it's it, th- th- there's other things on the blog, but that's what I want to talk about right now is just the emotional experience. The Holy Spirit is an experiential spirit. Okay, whenever you cut, whenever it comes to you, and he, he releases your antagonism towards God, that is a personal experience. That is part of your testimony. It's part of who you are. It's part of your systematic theology. You can't help it. And whenever I have it as number five, I'm not saying it's no good. I'm not saying, hey, you know, here, here's the last one, and if you you fail to use that or not use it well, don't worry about it. No, I'm saying all of these are incredibly important in building our systematic theology, and this is something you are going to have to see that you use on a daily basis, and it is good. It is a good thing to have personal experience and emotions. I personally seek after it. You've heard me say this many times. I would love to be a charismatic. The older I get, the more I want to, because the more I want to experience God in such a way. My theology, all the other pieces of the puzzle are put together in such a way to where I can insert a, well, not tradition, but as far as the Bible, um, I can insert a a, a charismatic worldview uh, to some degree, at least. I'm going to have to qualify that all the time because now I'm, okay, let's just say this. I want to be a charismatic because I want to experience God emotionally. And I want to experience God from the experience of the outside world, a prophet coming to me and talking to me, telling me something that God said. And that is true. Just to feel that, uh, to know that I know God loves me. I know, I know the Bible tells me, I know there's promises and all kinds of things I go to, but I would love to feel it. And so would you, you really would, uh, no matter what you say, you would. That's why, that's why emotion, that's why mystical theology is so incredibly awesome, but also is so incredibly dangerous. It really is. You can be guided by, it. you don't want to be guided by it. It's not, it's not, uh, you know, the, the engine to the train. Now it's too many metaphors, isn't it? It's not the biggest piece of the puzzle that you put in the middle. Okay. So that's mystical theology. Set that aside. This number five, number four, what is number four? It is natural theology or I put down here, scientific theology. Now, natural theology is, is that theology, which we look to, let me, let me give you a Bible passage. Okay. That's very important for natural theology. And you'll see how important these are. This is number four. And let me show you how important this is. I thought I had this up here. Okay, let's see here. I'm ter- I'm in Romans 1, and I'm going to chapter 18. You've heard me talk probably about this passage many, many times. It is. It's one that I, you know, you just say so many times. It's always being used in my theology. Always. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and right- unrighteousness. Well, why is God upset with men? Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Well, how is it evident? I mean, how? what are they supposed to know about you, God? Why are you getting mad at people whenever they haven't had the gospel or they haven't had, you know, got a Bible? There's no preacher that's ever come to their country. Why are you getting upset with these guys? They didn't know any better. This is the exact, that's the exact opposite of what this is saying. It says, why? Because God made it evident to them. How? How did he make it evident to them? Okay, listen to this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. Boom. Now notice here what it didn't say. It didn't say, for since the creation of the Bible... His invisible attributes, eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen. No, since the since the creation of the world. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about creation itself is a tutor in our systematic theology. 
it is a it is a i mean this creation contributes so so much to our systematic theology a lot of presuppositions a lot of things that are behind whenever we're looking at uh reading the bible whenever we're understanding the world i mean just think of it Creation has, uh, one of the things is I put down here, the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is the concept that explores the idea that the universe appears, appears. We look at the universe and it appears so, some way to be finely tuned to support human life. I mean, if you looked at all the factors that have to be perfectly in place for human life to be what it is right now, you would say, how in the world did that happen? You could come to a couple of conclusions. I mean, either one in a gazillion chance, well, that that can't even work because you have to have the, the stuff to begin with. There's no chance <laughs> they could do it without a, without a creator. But um, you, you look at this and you say, God must be incredibly intricate. Or let's put it this way. He's incredibly smart. Look what he did to put everything together from the, from the universe to the human cell, everything that has to be perfectly in place, man, he is so smart. He's got such a knowledge base. That's natural theology. He's, he's big enough to make this universe or powerful enough to make the universe that seemingly goes on forever and ever and ever. That's what they say, but I, I can't think that way. I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense as if it stops either. Neither one of them would make any sense if the universe kept on going and kept on going. Then I don't know how to process that. But I don't know how to process its opposite, which is the only other option, that it stops at some point. Because if it stopped, I mean, get a pickaxe and bang into the wall where it stops and make it go a little bit further. Uh, I just don't understand space. We don't. But I know that God does. And I also know from this, I know from the anthropic principle, I know from natural theology that God has to be outside of his creation. Uh, the Bible doesn't have to tell me, hey, God is not made up of, uh, of matter, or he's not made up of parts, or he's not made, uh, he's not in time, in his essence. It doesn't have to tell me that because he has to be. Why do I say he has to be? Because since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes have been seen. What are the invisible attributes? All of these things, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his uh, aseity, aseity. Ase means to be of himself. God has to be of himself. Ase, a non-contingent being. He has to have no priors that pushed him forward. He doesn't make his moves because somebody made him make his moves. He is the beginner. He is the unmoved mover. He's the starter of all things. I get that all from natural theology, every single bit of it. I don't need to pick up a Bible and know that stuff. And the Bible expects me to believe it. So much so that, as I said, we've got here that God, uh, listen to this. Uh, they, they All of these things, his attributes, eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, clearly. So that what? so that you are without excuse. So those two things present us with how how evident it is and then also how much we're held responsible for our natural theology. So build a natural theology. Always be building a natural theology. If somebody comes to you and says, I just use the Bible, I don't use natural theology, that is not true, number one. And don't listen to them because we are responsible to build a natural theology. Okay, that's number four. Let's go to number three. Number three is historic theology. Now, what is historic theology? Tradition. That's where we get into, you know, you called me a Catholic earlier. That's where we get into you uh, looking, we, us looking at tradition and tradition and historic theology. We, um, we look at this stuff and sometimes we, we look at other people who rely upon tradition. There are plenty of people who base everything they do, everything they know on tradition, but this is this is something that I'm saying it should be a part. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because people misuse tradition, just because that is the only thing that they believe, you believe what you believe because your church does it or we've always done it this way. Um, yes, that, that's problematic if you do it that way, but just because people do it that way doesn't mean that you do not use tradition at all. It is something that God has given to us. And let me tell you how it is, okay? I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to talk to you about this, um, uh, what's called the Vincinian Canon. 
the Vincentian canon, that's a great one to know, or the consensus, uh, uh, consensus uh, fidelum, the consensus of faith. Uh, the Vincentian canon is this. The Vincentian canon says that you have to have, well, let me go back to St. Vincent of Larens. St. Vincent of Larens says, whenever somebody came to him and said, how do you know what's true? Fourth century. How do you know what's true? Or uh, a little bit later, how do you know what's true? Uh, Because there's so many different options out there. St. Vincent of Larens said something really great. He said, "We, we endeavor to believe what has been believed always, everywhere, and by all. I had that up on the Credo House, uh, always, everywhere, and by all, right in the front whenever you walk in, because the Vincentian canon is so important to our theology. We do not come and say, hey, I don't care what the rest of the church for the last 2,000 years have believed because I'm smarter than them, or I don't care what they've believed because the Holy Spirit has come and revealed particularly to me that they were all wrong. What it basically says is this, if God is powerful, If the Holy Spirit is truly in the church, if the day of Pentecost truly happened and God is in control, if God's not just a cheerleader on the outside wondering what's going on and hoping the, you know, the, the guys can win the football game, which he's not, if he is sovereign in such a way, then he is controlling, he is moving, his spirit is evident in the history of the church. So you're going to look back upon the 2,000 years of church history, and we're going to have, a, we're going to have a, such a great resource to look to. Christ said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Well, I'm going to look back and see who all followed him. I'm going to look back and see what all they believed, all the people that were following him, what all did they believe? You say, Michael, they all believe lots of different stuff. I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's just a, such a variety out there. I don't know what to go with. Same thing that was said in the fourth century of St. Vincent. And again, I say, no, no, no. I want to find out what they all believe in common. I mean, kind of this least common denominator or just, I like it more as, a, as an understanding of a consensus. What do they all have consensus on? Uh, again, called the consensus fidelum, which uh, is the consensus of faith. Whenever you look at this, you see, oh, well, okay, there's a lot of things they do agree upon. I mean, everybody believes the Bible's inspired. Everybody believes that Jesus is God. Everybody believes that he rose from the grave. Everybody believes that we're sinners. Everybody believes that the cross somehow saves us. Everybody believes that we have to have faith. Everybody believes that works are a good thing. And so you pull all these things together, and you say, wow, the... If this has been believed for the last 2,000 years, there's a power behind it. And that power is the Holy Spirit. And I put that at number three. I put it before the nature thing about looking at nature. Why? Because I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit in the history of the church. And I cannot ever think I, I can be arrogant enough to disagree with the central elements that the church has always believed. I mean, you come up and you say something new, even if it looks good from scripture, I'm going to question it because I'm like, yeah, how are we getting this? Why didn't anybody else get it? Why is all of a sudden the Holy Spirit coming to us and telling this stuff? So that is the historic theology. Number three, very, very important. So can you guess number two? I know you guessed number one, but can you guess number two? Number two is very much like very much like the natural theology, but a little bit different because natural theology has to do with kind of science and testing. And it's, it's, it's very heavily dependent upon the data that's being fed in, that's being processed. So you have all this data that comes in. And as long as you get enough data or the right data, but we're always short on data. We don't always have all the facts. So the that that the uh, natural theology can break down uh, to where we just can't say with certainty things. Rational theology or philosophical theology, that's both, those are what I'm calling it, philosoph- philosophical or rational theology, that is where if you just said, hey, I want you to close your eyes right now, And tell me everything you know. Do not refer to the Bible. Do not refer to the church history. Do not refer to your emotions. Right now, just in your mind, rationally tell me what God must be like. Now, just think of all the things that you can come to. But here's here's the starting point. You say, 
I want you to decide what God can must be like, which is in your mind, you're already distinguishing. I know this is going to sound so dumb, but listen, you're already distinguishing must from must not. How did you get that? How did you, how do you know must and must not are different? Did the Bible tell you that? Did the church history tell you that? No, your mind is pre-built, pre-programmed, logic, rational conclusions, the law of non-contradiction. If I say, uh, tell me everything that God must be, you'll automatically know it's the opposite of what he must not be. That is just rational, and that's not something you have to, you have to get more data about. Rational theology is very, very definite. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like analytical theology. Uh, if I was to say to you, my wife has never been married, you would automatically say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You may not have all the data or anything like that. You may not even have talked to me or talked to her, uh, but you say that doesn't make any sense. I say, who says it doesn't make any sense? Ultimately, you're going to say, I say it doesn't. Because if being married is being as somebody's wife, is being married, then your wife has been married by definition. But you see, that's rational theology. It's rational theology. Triangle has three sides. If I said add four sides, you would call foul. And that's what our rational theology does. It's the most basic level of our theology. But let me tell you something, we can mess up on it pretty good. We, we, we We have a great way to mess everything up because we become irrational. We start believing one hand clapping type stuff. We start believing, hell, well, if it's God, he can do anything. Uh, and then we get to the point where we say, well, can he lie? Well, he's God. He can do anything. So, yes, he can lie. But wait a minute. If, he, if lying or truthfulness is part of his character, and his character is who he always is by necessity because he is uncreated and outside of time and he doesn't have a before and after, after then he has to be whoever he is, right? He can't lie. And that's a rational thing. It's built because we got information, intelligence from the Bible, and then we plug it into our rational theology and ask ourselves, what does this mean about God? And we come to so much stability because whenever we put these pieces in, rational theology, remember the puzzle I was talking about? Rational theology is a lot like the glue that glues this puzzle together, right? It's not so much a piece. It's just a glue that uh, holds it together. Maybe it's the shape. I don't know. It's something a little bit different. I like the glue. It's the glue that holds it together. Um, And so we have got philosophical theology here that is, I am making an argument, is incredibly important and is distinguished from any type of empirical method, which is the one I said in natural theology, where you're looking and you're testing. Okay, now here's the curveball. You're going to get a curveball. I didn't tell you about this one, so we got to figure this out. The next one we have to look at is, is the Bible? No, not the Bible yet. Number one is, is the Bible? No, I already said that we haven't looked at it yet. No, number one has to be the Bible because rationality just told me if the Bible is up there and we only have one left, then it's, then it's the Bible. Uh, The Bible didn't teach you that, so you're not sure. Yes, you are. You're sure rationally. I don't know why I did that. But listen, it's 1.2. 1.2. 1.2 I have on my list is special revelation. This is ongoing divine communication. Number one is going to be the Bible. It's the most authoritative because it comes straight from God. It's 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 the primary source because it comes straight from God. And so... Whenever we're talking about this on number 1.2, number 1.2, we have special revelation and special revelation is if God is still speaking today. So if God is still speaking today, then that is just as authoritative as the Bible. Now, I know you guys are, some of you guys are going to get real mad at me for saying that you are. I, I know you are because, uh, People who believe in continuing special revelation, which is being a charismatic, you know, that's what I want to believe. I do. I have nothing against God continuing to reveal himself. Who am I to hold back the hand of God? Doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that he was going to quit. So, and there, it may say, it may seem to suggest that he's going to continue in a few passages. So, um, I'm not a hard secessionist. A hard secessionist means 
that you believe the Bible stopped out of necessity due to exhaustion of purpose in the first century after the Bible was written or shortly after. I do not, I'm not a hard secessionist. I am a secessionist, but not a hard one because I don't think the Bible, I, I don't think it stopped out of necessity. Okay, but special revelation. If special revelation is still going on, basically God's still speaking to people. He's still speaking through prophets. And my deal is whenever whenever you, I have one of my charismatic friends who say, who say that, um, well, it's special revelation, the ongoing prophecy, but it's not as authoritative as the Bible. I say, well, wait a minute. What what if you what if you confirm that it is from God? Is it as authoritative as the Bible? Usually they say, no, 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 because I think you're going to get in trouble by me. And you're not going to get in trouble by me whenever you say that. I mean, he, here's what I say. If if we know it's God's word, if it truly is, if it's truly prophetic, and the Bible is truly prophetic, how can God's word be more authoritative than God's word? Come on, use your, use your, your rational theology there. So that you can't put that together. You can't do it. If it truly is God's word, it's just as authoritative as God's word. I know that whenever you get a new prophecy, let's say we got a new prophecy today. Let's say somebody came in to me here or called me up or put a comment on here <clears throat> that we uh, and said, hey, um, we have, we have, uh, or I've got a prof- prophecy for you. Well, I put this prophet to the test. I'm not doing it to make him lose. I'm doing it because I want him to win and I want it to be God's word, but I value God's word so much that I can't just say, okay, give it to me and I'll do whatever you say. I don't know that you're a prophet. I don't know that you're really has. I don't know that you just didn't see your own visions of your own imagination, like all the prophets in the old Testament and Jeremiah that were condemned coming up with things. They never stood in the council of God. There's plenty of people who are doing that and they may even do it for good reasons. Like in Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 13 or 23, one of the two, but they were giving good prophecies. Everything's going to be okay. You're all right. God loves you. Da, 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 da. That's usually what I get whenever I get a prophecy. It's people come to me and saying, Hey, I can see your suffering. God told me to tell you that he's here for you. You know, I'd love it to be true. Uh, it's always, it's always been good news, but every time I, I don't know whether it's true or not based upon what they say, because they never confirm it. But if they ever did confirm it, if they ever did follow by the path of a prophet, confirming it through some type of sign or wonder, because you got to understand if you're a charismatic, you have to understand why I don't accept it. You have to, and you have to see it as an honoring of God's word. Nothing against God still speaking today. I mean, I fear God's word. So and this isn't going to be all about charismatic stuff, but here, here, here it is. If it does pass the test, if he does do things that are a sign of a prophet, if it does conform with previously revealed truth, which the New Testament had to conform to the Old Testament, every newer book has to conform to the older book, older books. Every new prophecy has to conform to older prophecy. It's not true. That's one of the tests. So if it does conform to previously revealed truth, and you do pass the tests, then you are speaking for God. That's the deal. You are. I, 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 I would believe you. And you, you might say, well, well, come on. It's not as much as the Bible. I say, how in the world? How in the world can, can it be God's word? But just, uh, how, how do I categorize that? Is, is it, are you a prophet? Yes, I'm speaking for God. Okay. Is God authoritative? Yes, he is. Is he absolutely authoritative? Yes, he is. So if you're speaking for God, you're absolutely authoritative right now, or at least the words that you say. No, 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 they're not. They're not. I mean, the, the Bible's more authoritative. No, it's not true. So if God, special revel, if special revelation is still going on, then we have, and the Catholics believe in this too. I'm sorry, Catholics, I'm jumping on everybody. But Catholics, you guys believe in this too, no matter how you put it, no matter how you change it around. Whenever you have a pope, or a, a council. And I don't mind this either. I really don't mind if there's a Pope or a council. I've got nothing against it. I just don't see that God did it this way. I don't see evidence. I don't see proof. But if the Pope comes up and he speaks ex cathedra from the chair, then that is speaking authoritatively, just as authoritative as the Bible. And so therefore you are a prophet. You may term it something else, but it is prophecy, period. Uh, you say, no, it's not new revelation. That's not what prophecy always is. I mean, gosh, most of the prophecy and then uh, uh, most of the new Testament scriptures were just trying to help you to understand the old Testament scriptures. 
So there was nothing new. It was just the interpretation of it. And if popes and, and magisterial authorities that get together and have councils are authoritative and infallible, then, then it's still going on as well. I don't mind either one of those. I don't. I don't believe in either one, but I am open to it. It's very hard ever since because history has not seen it. So we got tradition to go up against, but uh, there's a lot of things that I I've been working towards and understanding a little bit different nuances. And so I'm, I'm still very open to it. I want to be charismatic. Don't necessarily want to be Catholic, but, uh, that's a different story. That's a different pathway. So if God is still speaking today, it is just as authoritative as what? It's just as authoritative as the canon of Scripture. That's number one. The canon of Scripture is our primary source for theology. It stands in front of all the others. The others guard and aid it. And why is that? Well, let me put it this way. The canon of Scripture is the only infallible... Wait a minute. I don't like that. I don't like it that it be that it's the only infallible. You're going to get mad at me here. I'm telling you, you're going to get mad. Some of you are, but I don't think it's the only infallible. I think rationality and reason are infallible when done right, when interpreted correctly. If you inter- if you interpret the law of non-contradiction correctly, it is infallible. I'm sorry, it is. I mean, if a triangle has to have three sides, then a triangle has three sides. Period. You can't get past that. I mean, everything that is infallible has to pass some of these tests, some of these what are called uh, properly basic beliefs, foundational beliefs to our understanding of everything. So rationality. And then, I'm sorry, here we go again. Natural theology, the Bible itself, Romans chapter 1, Psalm chapter 19, look them up, either one of them, the Bible itself says in Psalm chapter 19, that creation itself is another voice of God, that God created and told everybody through creation who he was. Romans 1, I told you that earlier. So is that infallible? Oh, well, of course it's infallible. How can God's word be more uh, be more authoritative than God's word? If it's God's word, it's God's word. Okay, so keep it there. Now, here's why I would distinguish scripture, is that it is the only articulated infallible source we have. Did you get that? It's the only articulated. I don't believe it's the only infallible. I believe it's the only articulated infallible. And whenever I talk about articulated, I'm talking about speaking and interpreting, attempting to interpret itself, interpret, interpret what it is saying to us in a way that we can understand. And, um, you know, speaking on human level, speaking through human language, that is articulated. So the Bible is the only articulated, infallible authority we have. And that's part of the reason why it is the most authoritative, because it is articulated. Articulated. But here's another reason. It's because what it speaks to. Creation itself does not speak to certain things like, who is Jesus? What did he do? Uh, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? What is the future like? What is the past? Those kind of things the Bible comes in and articulates for us and tells us, you know, why humanity got so screwed up. Nothing else will tell us that. Creation won't tell us that. Tradition doesn't tell us that. I mean, tradition may add a little bit, but not much. I mean, you look through the history of the world and you see everything screwing up because people sin, but you don't have the first sin. You don't have all the things the Bible articulates that are need to know. These are need to know things for our salvation. So we read the Bible so because we want to understand what does God think of us? What does God want us to do? What is the purpose what does God require of us in order to, uh, can we even have a relationship with him? Can we even um, uh, expect any future with him? Those kind of things. Can't get that any other source. That's why it's the, when, when we're talking about sources of our systematic theology, there's lots of sources, lots of things, but that middle piece is the Bible. It's the biggest piece and it has Jesus. That middle piece is the biggest piece, and it shows Jesus, and it shows enough of Jesus's face that we can make out that it's Jesus. That's kind of the idea of saying that it's uh, that it has a perspicuity, a clearness to it, clear enough that we can make out what we need from the Bible 
So therefore, any child reading the Bible can get that God loves you and you that we're sinners and that Christ died on the cross for our sins, all the basics. So that gets built on that centerpiece. And that's the Bible. It's only the Bible that has that. And then all the others, I'm not saying it's window decoration. I'm not saying all the others aren't important. Like I said, how are you gonna how are you gonna glue that piece together or that section together of the Bible that is about Christ? You need reason, you need rationality. So we're gonna be using all of these whether we know it or not. The Bible is the is the final source, the ultimate source. That's why I like to put it, the ultimate source. And if you're gonna use infallible, I'd say the ultimate articulated infallible source. A qualification there. Uh, because creation itself, the Bible says creation is the other word of God. So, okay. So what, what are we doing here? And well, let's see here. What, what, what we, how much time do we have? Wow. I went a long time. I'm not going to be able to talk about the other one, the ecosystem. We'll talk about that next time, but this is the entire, this is the entire picture of all the pieces that we have. And this is the importance of, wait, 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 I can see this. There, there's a question here. Which canon? That's a good question. That's a good question. Which canon? Well, okay. Where do we go to to be able to find out the canon? Find what the canon is. The canon is the books that belong in the Bible. Did you know the Bible itself does not have a list? I know your Bible. You say it does, but it's not inspired. I mean, everybody's Bible today has the list at the beginning on the first few pages tells us what books belong in the Bible, but that is not inspired. That was, did not come with the Bible. There's no book in the Bible, even in revelation where people say at the very end, it says, you know, no longer writing to this. That is not what it's talking about. It's talking about adding to the words of this prophecy. It's the same thing it said in Proverbs and Deuteronomy. I mean, that place is, that's in two other places in the Bible. So there's no canon list. Where do we get the canon? That's why we have all these other authorities. These all these pieces of the puzzle. And so we look back and we say, what is, what is the history been? Uh, what, what does history tell us? What is the, what are the sheep that hear his voice and follow him? What do they tell us? What does the Vincinian canon say? What does the uh, consensus of faith say? Well, the consensus from the very beginning is, it, it really is, our 66 books. The other ones have been debated. There's, there's other ones, yes, like the Apocrypha and, and a, a few other things that maybe go into the, uh, the Eastern Church and the uh, Ethiopia Church, Church. All of them use various canons, but the one, you can look at every single one, and what are the least common denominator? It is the 66 books. Powerful, powerful argument for the movements and the power of God in the history of the church to hand us the canon. So it's not the church as an authority. It's the tradition of the people of God that we see that is the authority. So those are all the pieces. I've given you all the pieces. You have no excuse now. You've got to use them. Wayne Grudem, I love you. I do love you. You're incredible. Um, I just don't like your definition of theology. I know you have a better definition too. Maybe you just did it for this book. That's okay. But it let me use you as a foil, which I, uh, which I like to do. I like to use you as a foil. I, I do that in, in the, uh, charismatic room. Uh, I would do that with the charismatic stuff as well. Prophecy. Don't like your view of prophecy. I've talked to you about you more than 20 times in a good way. I had at least two to give. And I'm telling you, your view of prophecy where it can be wrong. Uh-uh. Sorry, it just won't work out. It won't. But anyway, I do love him. He's he's incredible. He's a lot smarter than I am. So uh, believe him instead of me. Okay, guys. Listen, once again, I, I thank you for this. Coming to Theology Unplugged, I thank you for um, for all you do for the ministry. I thank you for all your prayers. I, th- I know you see some of this stuff that's going on in the background with, uh, with the Credo House. And just keep on praying about it. And uh, most importantly for now, I know I keep on bringing this up. But for those of you who do love what we're doing, who understand it, please become a patron. This is this is the way to support us. This is the primary way you can go from anywhere from a three dollar member a month to a two thousand dollar member a month. Uh, and there's there's all kinds of things that you get. But primarily, whenever you're doing this, you're saying I'm supporting the type of stuff that Credo House does, the education, the making theology accessible, the ironic approach where we try to represent all positions with fairness. 
It doesn't mean that I don't have my positions. I do. You know that. But at the same time, I do not ever want to misrepresent somebody else. And I do not ever want to overemphasize the uh, underemphasize or overemphasize the importance of something. And there's a lot of things that even whenever I disagree, like with Catholics, that uh, we have in common. But listen, guys, I, I do appreciate you for being here and listening to this for this entire time. 50 minutes. Wow. Me talking by myself. But next time, we're going to talk about theological ecosystem. Theology 